Okay, so uh, it is, uh, good morning. It's Wednesday, February 24th, 10, 15 a.m. This is the second uh, session of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee's uh, morning meetings for today. Um, with that, just wanna make sure that uh, we have a quorum present. All right, I see people are back. Um, like to uh, turn to uh, Mr. Wabi, who is uh, representing Associated General Contractors of Vermont with us today. So um, we, uh, it's good to see you. Welcome to the committee. Uh, and as you've, you've been here for much of the conversation this morning, so uh, you know that, but for those who are just going to be hearing this for the intro for the first moment, tuning in for YouTube part two. Um, we're looking as a committee at growing the workforce to uh, implement uh, the green energy economy or the clean energy economy, it's got different names. Um, and an important piece of that is reducing energy use. An important piece of that is uh, uh, building buildings in such a way that they're more energy efficient. So we know the, the folks out in the trades are making that happen every day. And we'd love to hear from you about um, basically how our interest in, in increasing the rate at which we do this work, how we can partner with you guys to help you uh, get there. So, and your advice to us as policymakers <laughs> and programmers. So my name is Richard Wabi. I'm with the Associated General Contractors. I've spent roughly 20 years. I'm not a administrator and I don't always talk uh, correctly. So I'll apologize when we start. <laughs> I, uh, Mr. Senator McDonald is acknowledging that. The, uh, um, I, I've been in the field, I spend time in the field and um, AGC uh, roughly 25 years ago started to enter this workforce development and workforce training field, both um, through technology and through um, in-person training. Um, over those 20 years, we have become the largest provider of training um, across the state, but it's in one particular sector. It's, and I hear everybody talking about all the sectors. So my heart lies in one particular sector and that sector is the construction sector. Um, we train um, approximately uh, 2000 people a year about 1,500 different individuals. So some are repeat or multiple courses. Um, we have been the founding member of the Vermont Construction Career Council and still operate that. We have been partners along the way with most of the people that you have heard from today. Um, to include, I noticed um, Vermont Works for Women is here, the uh, Vermont Talent uh, pipeline, um, the uh, uh, different groups, even down to we helped start the uh, one of the uh, community high school or the correctional high school uh, programs to bring people from that program into our uh, sector or into our businesses and help them get placed, help them uh, start to earn and become a more productive uh, citizen. Um, we've been rec recognized nationally, not just in the state, but nationally, whether it's by the National Safety Council, by um, the, the mining and safety uh, folks, the uh, uh, Department of Labor, but we, as well as we were on, and you, you come back to the green schooling, and I, I think that's um, a great thing. Somewhere around 10 years ago, we started and developed, helped develop different lean courses. And that's what we call it here in construction is lean. Um, lean courses that produce um, different rated uh, energy efficient buildings. Um, and we provide training in those worlds. We um, also helped and was on, were on the forefront because when we start talking green 
training. It's not just production, but we also look at the safety. There's different aspects of safety within green production. And we work with uh, Federal OSHA to develop a full green um, uh, outline for training and safety training within this green world. And, and we put it to good use and have put it to good use between the, the solar fields, installation of solar, um, installation of the turbines, in different areas that we have already seen develop across the state. Probably um, another big piece is we work with the weatherization programs, both in, uh, through Brock out of Rutland, Bennington, that area, and uh, Capstone here in central Vermont, and CBOEO up in the Chittenden County area and help them develop their original uh, weatherization program. So we've sat at many tables and we've, we've really uh, branched out and, and gone out into that. Um, presently today, I find myself as the executive vice president of AGC, but my love of the training and my love of the field people uh, preclude me from actually sitting in that chair over in my office. Um, I like the train, I'm comfortable in a training room and that's where we're actually sitting here today. Throughout the pandemic and prior to the pandemic, about two, two and a half years before the pandemic hit us, we started to go virtually because we found it was easier to reach the people and easier to offer the courses for them to be able to take that time instead of the time out of a work day. We could deliver at night. We could deliver early in the morning. And, and so we, we had everything in place. Um, we never missed a beat during the pandemic and kept things going. Just a, um, you, there were a couple questions out there. I just want to reiterate. Um, somebody asked about the uh, uh, career centers and what is the delivery process coming out of the career centers? Um, roughly, we are able to harvest about 20% of the people coming directly out of the career centers. And we have a very robust recruiting uh, process that includes us operating a career day. And we have uh, 20 different um, uh, units of our sector, whether it's plumbing, electrical, cranes, um, 20 different units of our sector that show off their stuff for a day for these career centers. And we bring roughly 700 students down here to Montpelier um, and they're allowed to operate some different equipment. They're allowed to uh, wire some different walls to do some different things as well as we have a whole recruiting room set up for those people that want to hire the uh, students coming out of the career center. Roughly 20% of those people graduating from the career center enter our industry right off that bat. Roughly 40% go on to other educational needs or other skills. Um, and then we, we lose 40%. We, I mean, and we've tried, we're a small organization, we've tried to uh, um, uh, scout them, we've tried to see where they've gone. I'll tell you, they're just, they're just lost. Um, whether they're making pizzas or working at an auto dealership or working in the family business, we just lose them. So there's 40% we lose. The other funny thing is um, back about two years ago on a national basis, there was a study done uh, about the usefulness of the career center. And the construction side of the career center was the number one rated piece with the career centers, but it was on, it was number one rated, but it was only 40% of the kids or the students claimed it was actually useful. Um, when you, but when you looked at the uh, sector, our sector, the construction employers, they felt 60% of that, those uh, opportunities were successful. Um, the, uh, so just a couple quick 
thoughts on that whole piece. And I do understand that this is uh, geared towards weatherization and, and the green future, which we all hold dear. Um, and we want better for the future than we've had today. Um, I understand that one of the problems though in any of this is going to be delivery. And, and delivery comes in two forms. One, being able to find and allocate the workforce that would be able to um, weatherize 2,000 houses a year. Right now, that workforce doesn't exist. We presently have roughly 17,000 people within the construction workforce. And that's looking at right, right across the board, whether you're looking at HVAC, electrical, plumbing, uh, uh, stick building, or horizontal building. You've got 17,000 people. At that present piece, um, we, we have logs going back a year trying to get things, meaning jobs. You try to hire somebody to come in and weatherize your house or put in a new a landscape for your uh, business or build a new bridge. And we're logged back roughly 12 months because the workforce doesn't exist today to handle any sort of upswing or whatnot. Now, we can turn around and start to look at how does apprenticeship affect this and how do these other pieces affect this? We need the people on the ground before, so we need a, a more robust recruiting piece to get them in there. We, I work, it's a real diverse group I tend to work with. Um, and, and I wasn't just throwing diversity in there for the sake of political means. I'm telling you, it's been a diverse group. I, I mentioned Vermont Works for Women. We sat with Tiffany 20 years ago and helped develop their first construction uh, entry program. Um, we work both with members and non-members to develop programs for them and delivery programs for them. And then as well, we work with both union and open shop groups. The problem when I start to look at um, either of those groups is Vermont is 95% open shop. So, and, and in being open shop, we have, in, or, in order to keep that open shop, we have offered wages and benefits that are as good or better than most union shops out there right now. So, so we're dealing with this recruiting delivery piece um, on a bunch of different levels. And how do you get them out? I'll, I'll tell you probably one of the most disappointing um, pieces, and I wish she was still here. Um, one of the most disappointing pieces we did, we spent three years in the community high school system. Um, that, and, and I'm using that word, I'm hoping you guys understand that at one time was the name of the correctional educational system. Um, we spent three years uh, working with them and the biggest hindrance to it was that we had parole officers that would not meet outside of work hours. And then we had a multitude of restrictions put on the people coming out of the correctional facility that wouldn't allow a company that's based in Washington County to take that employee to Bennington to work for a week. Um, I mean, we there's mu multiple stumbling blocks, which we all know and understand. But um, overall, over the last 20 years, to give you an idea, I mentioned we, we worked and helped develop the original uh, weatherization program. Um, we do the OSHA training, which we could go into. There's multiple, both skill and safety areas that we do within the mining field. And it's not just in Vermont, we service uh, the mining field across the country. Um, we, uh, work um, and our partners with uh, the Vermont Independent Electrical Contractors. And we offer not only training, the apprenticeship piece, um, as well as all the refreshers and updates that have to be done um, out there for them. 
we do the uh, traffic control and uh, traffic con and entry level traffic control, uh, traffic control technician courses, all that. Um, we do uh, stair, rafter, how to use square training. I'll tell you, I was, and what the reason we do scare, square training, square training, the reason we do that, um, it actually came out from some of the contractors saying, if you could teach somebody very simply, I will hire them tomorrow as many as you can teach. If you could just teach them to be able to read a ruler and use a uh, builder square. If you could do those two things, we can use them all day long. And, and it was little things. So, so we ran courses on stair and rafter building, which, which is uh, 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 carpenter square on steroids. If you could learn how to build stairs, that, then you've got it. Um, blueprint reading, and we've partnered with VTC uh, for blueprint reading. We uh, uh, supervisory training. We're in the middle, um, in the middle, starting out on a, a whole uh, supervisory list, a communications list, an estimating list, a budgeting list, um, things like that. Um, we do interior or have done interior and exterior uh, trim finishes, modifications, things like that. Uh, commercial door and weatherization door installation, um, heavy equipment training, and uh, work zone safety stuff. Um, that just, and, and I know I just threw a whole big fishbowl into your party here, but I, I just, we have the, the, in my mind, the problem is twofold, recruiting and then delivery to the field. And how do we do that? And I, I'm sure, uh, people will support what I'm saying. It's finding the people that are actually interested in doing this. Okay. Well, <clears throat> um, so th th thank you for that. And it sounds as though you have uh, firsthand experience in, <laughs> in everything we've been talking about for, for decades. So it's great to hear you know, um, your experience view like, so here's the thing, one thing you said that worries me a little is you talked about, well, about 10 years ago, there was an interest in green jobs. And I don't know if it included weatherization at that moment. Yeah. I'm getting the feeling from when the way you say that, that it, there was sort of a surge and then maybe it sort of fizzled some on the, so is it been kept going or what's no, the story no, there? No. Um, Senator, it comes down to a contract element. I'll just, I'll just explain that. Um, the average person, can they afford an actual green building? Can they actually afford a green envelope to yep. um, put in their, their facility? Now, you, you get the larger companies that are very aware of the savings and the, uh, the different financial aspects and your lean building um, runs, it goes. Um, and I call it lean, and it is called lean, by the way. It's lean building, um, and that goes, and that's accepted, but it tends to be a contract element. When we start looking at building or, or updating buildings, you and I both know it comes down to dollars and cents. What can I afford to put in place today versus, um, tomorrow. And so, so where I say we were on a loop, um, yeah, it kind of spiked, but it didn't bottom out. Okay. So the green building piece is still running a baseline in there that I would say is about 50 to 60% of where we would like to see it. We'd like to see it higher, but the expense to do so has not come down to justify some of that added expense out there. And I don't mean to you know, throw yeah. water on your fire here. I'm just trying to tell you that that's the way it is. <laughs> no, and, and well, it's good to hear you know, what we, we don't wanna be sheltered from the truth as you see it, that's for sure. So the, um, the thing that we're, one of the things we're working on is to make it more affordable to enter that contract. And um, 
you know, through innovative financing, things like that. And one, there's a group of people who think that if we get the money so that and make it attractive so that more people say, okay, now, now I can afford to go ahead and I've wanted to go ahead, I'm going ahead, that that demand out in the field will pull people into the trades will just naturally respond. People will show up, they'll get the training and that we don't, you know, uh, we should be thoughtful about building a pipeline, but the strongest thing we can do is create demand in the, and that'll bring people to the field to deliver the service. Does that make sense to you or is that wishful thinking? I, I think it's wishful, my friend. Uh, and the reason I think it's wishful is I think, I think we can create demand. Demand, we're, we're gonna see it, we can see it. it, we can create that demand. The problem is creating the, the recruiting and the delivery system to actually be able to handle the demand. So, so when you talk 2,000 houses a year, we're going to weatherize two. And, and again, I'm being very simplistic in this. Um, when you look at weatherizing 2,000 houses a, a year, you're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of weatherizing 40 or 50 uh, facilities a week, right? When you start looking at 40 or 50 uh, pieces a week, this tends to be a multi-man operation. So now we're looking at an added thousand people that we need in the workforce in order to deliver that demand. And, and I'm telling you, we, our rates, our salaries, our benefits are far better than anything around us in this. I mean, we're paying flaggers $18 an hour. <laughs> your, your weatherization people are making $25 and $28 an hour. We're paying wages. And when you start to talk like that, then you've got you've to just step back and say, people just aren't interested in this occupation. And how do we get them interested or re-interested in this occupation? Part of the problem is, and, and again, this is me, I don't know squat, but part of the problem with it is, is that it is a, a construction uh, occupation is looked down upon by parents. So from the time these students enter the career center or whatnot, they're being told they should do anything other than build. That's not good for you. Try to do, learn to do computer program, learn to do this, anything but that. And, and so we're fighting that constantly. Okay. So I, I don't think your, your, your ideas are great. I love them. But without the uh, people to actually do the work, and we just aren't delivering enough people to the industry. It's not going to work. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, it's good to <laughs> it's good to have you know honest. We need candid input, so that's what we're here for today. Um, any questions for Mr. Wabi from the committee? All right. Well, thank you for hanging Hold on. with us. And Hold on. Come on, Senator McDonald. You can ask me something, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just take the pitch. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. It was good to be here. I'm going to hang on on the side. I'm interested in uh, Ms. Bayes and um, comments as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to go to uh, Mr. Burke. Good morning. Good to see you again. I think the last time I saw you might have been in government operations, but... Um, we wanted, again, so we're trying to cast a broader net than um, perhaps we have in the past, looking for uh, folks who would be looking for uh, uh, not just employment, but uh, I'll, I'm getting schooled this morning, a career path in the clean energy technology fields. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about the folks you represent and if there are opportunities to work with your organization and um, and veterans. Well, good morning. Yes, uh, I'm Robert Burke, Director of Veterans Affairs for the State of Vermont. 
Um, so obviously my constituents are veterans, uh, prior military. Um, so there are opportunities and the, the State Department of Labor um, has been doing some uh, job fairs um, in person, obviously before the pandemic, reaching out to Fort Drum and looking at service members who are getting ready to leave active duty and looking for opportunities. So they had uh, had and, and continue to try to have as active as they can a program to try and draw you know, that, that part of the population in um, you know, to reinvigorate the workforce. Um, some of the complications though, it, as, as Mr. Wabi has demonstrated is, is not only getting people interested in it, but if you look at Vermont's veteran population, so a little over 42,000, um, but 70% of those folks are 55 years of age or older. So, you know, you've got about 30% of that population, you know, is between eight and 54. So, you know, that, that doesn't kind of give you a, a big audience. Um, so we've looked at incentives uh, before in, in, you know, how do we attract more veterans uh, to come to Vermont? Um, certainly with, with the governor's support, we've tried, you know, to launch um, for the, the uh, state uh, income tax exemption for retired veterans. Um, you know, that, that has failed for the past three years. Um, you know, licensure, um, um, transportability. So, so some of those uh, pieces have been put into legislation. So if you have a CDL, if you're an equipment operator, if you're a paramedic, plumber, et cetera, you know, your, your military experience can transfer into quicker licensure within the state. Um, so we, we try and come up with as many um, different types of incentive programs as we can uh, and, and are always um, open uh, for new suggestions. Um, I don't, are you uh, for veterans who are uh, either, we're already Vermonters or are, are moving here. Do you have a sort of, a, is there a regular forum where people reach out to you and say, uh, I'm re-entering, you know, the civilian life and uh, can you help me connect with, um, how do I get started on finding a civilian job now that I'm going to be out of the, out of the military? Is that part of, you know, a routine part of your work with veterans? It, I mean, the referral side, yes, um, but there's a, <clears throat> a veteran coordinator at the Department of Labor, uh, and he's, you know, very in tune and in touch with matching veterans to job opportunities, virtual job fairs now, um, and different opportunities within the, within the state. Okay, um, and I I'm guessing uh, there must be folks who come out of the military with a fair amount of sort of building trades related, if not weatherization exactly, uh, building trades experience. Um, is, is that correct or? There, there's, a, there's a fair amount of, of different trades within each of the services that are, that are easily transportable, you know, into a civilian career. Okay. Um, and how about um, funding that helps, say a veteran identifies something they're interested in? Is there sort of a modern GI bill so that uh, they can, sign up for classes at uh, uh, VTC or elsewhere, that kind of thing. Yeah, so the post 11 GI Bill uh, is out there, uh, as well as, you know, the Guard offering tuition reimbursement to state schools, um, VTC uh, included in that. Uh, and that's always kind of a popular option for either a two-year or a four-year. Additionally, there's um, training, uh, you know, tractor trailer trades, uh, trade schools um, that they can use their uh, GI Bill benefits to get training at. Okay. And do you have any idea what the take rate is with those? Are they highly subscribed, popular, or any, any I don't know if you know, or you track that kind of thing. I, I don't think I can provide you numbers, um, but I know that the, the great deal of people who are re, you know, leaving service and do have that benefits, um, very few of them kind of leave those on the table. 
Um, if they already have training or degrees, it's transferable to family members. So that's, that's another opportunity to, to pass it down the generation. Sure. Um, we were, I don't know if you know Dwight DeCoster, who, uh, who runs the uh, weatherization program at CVOEO. Um, but I think he was career military. And when he talks about how he organizes an operation, <laughs> I, that military training seems to be useful, you know, in terms of uh, defining things, organizing resources, managing people, et cetera. It's, it's kind of hard to forget. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, any, so any committee questions for Mr. Burke? All right. And it's great to know that you already have someone embedded at Vermont DOL who would be uh, in the loop on how any of these things might, you know, opportunities as they arise while we continue to work with labor. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, have a good day. Uh, and with the next, I'd like to go to uh, Ms. Basden at Vermont Works for Women. So good morning, thanks for joining us. Um, we just heard Mr. Wabi talking about helping 20 years ago already, time flies, setting up the first construction trades program with you folks. Um, as you've heard, we're interested in uh, weatherization this morning, not just that, but uh, that's the thing that's driving the conversation. So we're wondering if you could talk to us about how your organization participates in it now, and if there's ways that you see that as we think about doubling the, the rate at which we're doing this work, that we could do things that would be helpful to your organization. Absolutely, and thanks for having me here this morning. So Vermont Works for Women, again, it's been 30 years of really supporting women and girls on a path towards economic independence. And that's in a multitude of different industries, but there has been a large focus on the trades and really trying to increase the female workforce in the trades. So we, our organization does a blend of programming. We do a hard skills program in construction, welding, um, and plumbing. And so that is NCCR certification. It does OSHA 10. It really does entry level skills in construction, but it also blends with employability skills. So showing up on time, effective communication, support in getting into the industry and self-advocacy. So that's how we really support the participant side. And interesting to hear about, you know, recruitment. Recruitment is definitely an issue, but at Vermont Works Women, we have a wait list for our Trailblazers construction training program. Um, we have women calling all the time, really wanting to get into the industry and really getting into the field. So I think that there is a lot of potential to really increase that. I think what we see is retention in the field are a lot of the problems that we encounter. So it's whether it's, um, you know, work culture environment, whether it's supporting family needs, whether it's a single mother who lost her job because she couldn't show up on the work site each day at the same time. Um, so we really try to support women, one, in getting those careers, but then being retained in the field. So we do a lot with trying to work with construction sites or employers to really support the female workforce in the different barriers that can come um, about. So we have done specifically in weatherization, we work with SunCommon and other solar installers really in their recruitment efforts to try to recruit a female workforce. We do not do a specific training program in solar installation or weatherization. We're currently working with Vermont Rural Water and Natural Resources to also help increase female recruitment and retention in the field, knowing that there's going to be a large demand in that specific field as well, and they do not get a female workforce that comes in. Um, we also are trying to support some of the state's apprenticeship programs in recruiting higher numbers of women in those fields. I think part of the problem that we see, and this is to Richard's point, when you're looking at recruitment, there's not a large representation of women right now. So a lot of younger high school or middle school girls that we work with that are in our Rosie's Girl build and weld camps that have this passion and excitement for the field, that really starts to dwindle as they get older and don't see themselves represented in the field whether that's at the Technical College Training Center or whether that's actually in the industry itself. So that's one of the reasons I think we see a huge issue in not meeting that demand. I do wanna say that I think, you know, in Vermont, 50% of the population being women, there are a lot of young girls really wanting to get into the construction trades. They know it can be economically 
beneficial to them. It can meet a lot of the family demands or goals that they have and have strong interest. And so I, there could be programming or targeted efforts towards how can we make recruitment more representative, but how can we also make retention more positive and representation higher for women in the field? Huh. Well, so it's interesting that the demand side, or the interest side is high. Um, and, uh, and then how about, uh, what, how many people can you train in a year? I mean, for instance, if you have a wait list, do you wish that you had more resource so that you had less of a wait list? Yeah, I think that's the, our training programs, because we're a small community-based organization, they can be expensive to run. The instructors are a high cost, facilities, time, all of that. And so we are limited based on the funding that we could run to run that program and really support because we also tried to get all of our participants work boots, pants, fully set up with gear so that they can walk ready onto a work site. What we're starting to look towards in the future because the demand is so high in our programs and because we feel that it's gender specific and supported and that's why the demand is so high, it's a higher level of support you get in this training program that we're trying to work with the state apprenticeship programs to say, how can we make those environments more supported? So that way, if we do have a demand and wait list, how can we gear some of those participants towards apprenticeship programs that are available at the state level or that are available in other training programs, specifically to youth um, working with UICC or resource to try to create pathways to just meet participant needs, um, whether it's transportation, financial, whether they have a second job. And so our training programs have to be at nights or they have to be on weekends or they have to be flexible enough to meet the different barriers that are across the state. Okay. Um, does Vermont Works for Women receive state or federal funding? We do receive in certain, we work closely with Department of Corrections. So actually our Trailblazers construction training program, we do run in the facility at CRCF, the women's facility, to try to get women jobs on the field after. I think Richard nailed it when he said um, there's a lot of other barriers and red tape to getting those positions. Um, but Yes, we do receive DOC funding for that. Uh, we don't specifically receive funding for that training program, but our participants have been able to access, whether it's WIOA funding or VSAC funding to support continuing education, but that's on a limited basis. So there is not a consistent stream of funding to support this training program as of yet. Okay. Um, and yeah, so having worked construction, uh, a few years myself, I can, there were not that many women on the job site, some job sites, none, right? So um, how, <laughs> is this a question of, we just need more women on more job sites before it's going to become less of a stressful environment? I, I don't know how, what to call it. You know, like if you're, if you stand out on a job site, you know, I can imagine it would be somewhat stressful, right? And that's where we really saw the benefit of starting to work with not just participants, but employers as well. So we didn't, Vermont Works Women doesn't want to be a recruiting necessarily for the trades. We want to help employers really do this sustainably and independently. So in working with employers, we really try to do what we call a gender equity audit. So let's look at your practices and policies. Let's look at your marketing and recruitment. Let's look at how you interview and is that a barrier to women, one, applying? So that's just part of it. Two, we also try to give um, resources to help. So really hiring two women at a time is going to make it more successful. And you're right. We need more women for this to just naturally and organically happen. Right now, because that's not happening, we really have to try to build that representation there. So we encourage, um, we really encourage our employers to hire two women at a time if you do not have a current female workforce really doing a review of any of your policies and practices or any, what is the job site like? What are, what happens if it is a single mom who has a sick kid? Is there a backup plan to help support that employee? Things like that. So it is a little difficult because while you don't have representation, it makes it hard to recruit, but I think we are slowly seeing the doors open up a little bit more when it comes on the employer side for that. And we have a lot of our construction partners 
who are really open to policies and practices. They have a huge demand for labor. They want workers. They don't care if you're male or right. female at a certain point. Right, sure, sure, great. Um, so uh, any, ad I guess we're also looking for recommendations. Is there anything as we're looking at a program? We're not designing it today. You know, it's just, we're getting the conversation really started today. Um, and I think we will have a working group that is going to come back with more specifics uh, for the beginning of next session. Um, but are there things that you would put on our, on your, if you were on that group right now, you know, are there things you'd say, address this, or here's a recommended practice. I mean, for instance, you were just saying hiring two women at a time, but other recommendations or things that you think that group should be addressing as we get going on this work in, in much greater depth. Yeah, I think there could be a lot of work done on the state apprenticeship side. So adding more apprenticeship opportunities and slots available, but also putting goals to that. A certain percentage should be women um, in order to build that representation in those fields. Right now, if you look at the state apprenticeship numbers in electrical or plumbing, there's no women. Um, and I think over the years, there's been just a handful. So that could be a start, a really targeted effort to get women into state, state apprenticeship and training programs one would be a great place to start. And then gender supported training programs. So there's a lot of opportunities, whether it's with our organization or other organizations that really are running these training programs already. You know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel on doing this. And so how can we better collaborate with those community-based organizations and the state? And it might be a funding stream or it might just be a broader training collaboration as well. Okay, great. Um, yes, I, I have a, a acquaintance who's an electrician, master electrician, 50-ish. His daughter worked with him for years and then left, <laughs> even though she makes less doing her new job and then her old job. So I can see even if, and I'm guessing that, well, who knows? <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, yeah, retention, I could see how it would be a, a harder, a hard thing to pull off because um, the new job has a full package of benefits and she can see sort of a, a long career path there. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, making the time to come in and share your thinking with us and we'll we'll, we'll keep on going this morning and there's a lot more to do. Um, um, and now your former executive director is uh, in the house. So you guys have a good connection to the legislature. We do, it's great. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. And with that, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to next go to uh, Action General Knight, who's with us this morning. Or his tile is here, and I'm guessing he's behind it. <clears throat> uh, General Knight, I don't know if you can hear me. We are coming back around and asking if you are here. I'm not sure what the issue is there. Give it a minute. Sometimes, as we know, there's hiccups on all these things. Um, Jude, I don't know if you can reach General Knight through. I just, I uh, just emailed his administrative assistant to say we're okay. waiting for him. <clears throat> yeah, Senator, he, okay. he's just Senator, he, he's just getting off of another call. I just talked uh, to the office there, so he just stand by. Thanks so much. Um, so, committee, there were folks that um, uh, just to round out the picture that we didn't were uh, that were already busy and couldn't come in. Oh, here's the general. So we'll we'll change gears and we'll have our discussion after. Uh, good morning, General Knight. Good to see you again.
And just so you know, uh, your connection is still muted from our side. All right, we've we've said something so offensive they've left the room. Um, see, if we, <laughs> see, see, if we, see if we can get them back. <laughs> All right, here we go. So I don't know if uh, you folks there. Uh, can hear me. This is Senator Bray, and uh, we're hoping General Knight can come online with us now. We're ready for you. And all right, so the mute sign just went off. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Senator. How are you today? Great. Thanks so much. Um, We've been having a conversation this morning about uh, workforce development in the state of Vermont, particularly as it relates to trades and um, within trades uh, weatherization, because we have uh, frankly ambitious goals uh, in terms of trying to weatherize more homes uh, for a variety of reasons, saves people money and reduces uh, emissions that we don't wanna have to begin with. So uh, we're trying to make sure that we reach out to all sorts of different sectors of the Vermont uh, community and hear more about how folks in your community might connect to this work because as, as I'm sure you know, um, one of the challenges is finding people uh, to enter the trades and take up this work. So we don't know much about when members of the guard uh, retire from the guard, what comes next and how um, uh, folks in your community might become part of the weatherization trades community? Well, there's, I'll tell you, Senator, there's a number of ways to get at this. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I'll talk about it here in some detail uh, in a minute. Uh, but the short answer is there's a number of mechanisms internal to us to share that information. Uh, we can certainly do it through family programs, uh, through our deputy chief of staff of personnel, through our subordinate commands uh, to get the word out in particular, um, focusing on the two thirds of the organization that are traditional drilling members of the guard. Uh, that's where the focus is. Um, the other way to message that is, is through uh, both the Air and Army National Guard have what we call on the Army side, the recruit sustainment program. And on the uh, wing side with the Air Guard, it's the future flight program. So these are new soldiers and airmen who are waiting to ship to basic training. And, and many of them, uh, when they come back, they're going to have a great part-time job with us, uh, but they may very well be looking to seek education and work in the trades and, and do exactly what you're talking about. Uh, bigger picture, uh, what I'm really trying to do is, is kind of go big. Uh, one thing that I think we haven't done well in the past 10 years uh, is really focus on production recruiting. Uh, Vermont has some challenges with a very small recruiting demographic. It's also a very competitive environment for us. Um, one of our shortcomings is simply messaging all of the benefits that, that come by joining the Guard, which to me is one of the best part-time jobs in the world. Uh, and that's where legislators can help us because you have constituents. Constituents have kids, and we want to grow and retain talent here in Vermont. So uh, I've engaged with uh, Dustin Degree and the Department of Labor. And what we're working on doing is, is revising and revamping the Think Vermont website. So I've aligned this idea. I came up with it about a year ago in speaking with General Tim Orr, who's since retired, but he's a former Iowa adjutant general. And he worked with their governor and came up with Home Base Iowa. So it's homebaseiowa.gov is the website. It is veteran friendly. Um, they're just selling Iowa. Um, they are marketing Iowa and that they're targeting very specifically uh, the audience and, and folks that you're looking for, Senator. Um, it's a very user-friendly user -friendly website. 
you can go on there as a veteran, as a retiree, and within a matter of a couple of clicks, you can find a supportive employer and post your resume. Um, and there are a number of success stories on there. So I've engaged with Dustin um, and, and some folks at the Department of Labor and Commissioner Harrington uh, to kind of parallel that effort. In my view, we can make it better. Uh, we have a great product here. This is a remarkable state to live in. Um, I think we need to market that. I, I do have selfish interests. I need to grow the guard. Uh, but for me, this becomes a, a, a nationwide, if not global, effort, at least for me. Um, I would market it through my counterparts on the active duty. Um, we have reserve component career counselors or transition assistance teams. Uh, every branch of service has that at major installations. Uh, I just think we need to do more to bring talent here. If it's a first term enlistment or commissioned officer who comes off of active duty, they have the opportunity to continue service here in Vermont. Um, and they can do that as a drilling member and find viable employment here. Um, so this should play exactly into what you're discussing here. Um, they don't know what they want uh, in a lot of instances. These are kids uh, to me, I'm, I'm not a young man, but these are kids that come off their first term of enlistment, they're 23 to 25 years old. If they're coming to the Northeast, come to Vermont. Um, we can market that. And, and I think if, if we get that website out there, for instance, the Think Vermont website, and we make it better and friendly, and we start targeting specifically those installations, um, we can bring people to Vermont. We can bring talent here. And I think that would help um, alleviate some of the need um, that you're trying to address here. And I can talk you through an example of, of numbers if you have a minute. Sure. Um, I, and just so, uh, can you fill in the committee? My brother actually was uh, Air Guard. And so they, you know, they sent him off to Air Force for training. And then he returned and flew a variety of planes ending up in F-16. So that, that's sort of the only channel I'm familiar with, people entering uh, on the young side, going off for training and returning. But... Can you, I don't really, honestly, I don't, now I'm realizing I don't know everyone who's in the guard. Like if, if most of them are former full-time military or can you say something about who's, who's in your, who's in the guard, how old they are and what kind of employment they're looking for? Well, it's, uh, Senator, it's a little bit of both. Um, we have uh, what we call field enlistments. These are folks that come in specifically to join the guard. Um, that's probably, uh, I would say, 50% of, of our enlistments or commissions, uh, either through ROTC, Norwich University, through a senior military college, or New Mexico Military Institute. They may come here and commission here and enlistments in both the Air and Army. Um, and then probably the rest of our enlistments or commissions are, are interstate transfers. They come from our partner states, uh, other guard states, other guard units. Uh, some folks will come to us from active duty. They will transition. Uh, some of us come from the reserves, Air Force or Army Reserves, and there's probably a smaller group that will come to us uh, from the different services, um, not Air or Army, but Navy, Coast Guard, uh, and Marine Corps. So it's a little bit of everything. Uh, I don't have a, a good sense of, of what they're looking for in work, but I, I think we won't know until we ask the question. Um, I do know that there are folks that are looking for full-time employment. I hear it frequently. Um, so I, I think it's for us is, is getting a better handle on where that need is and messaging it. And we can help you do that. Okay. And so in terms of employment that um, members of the guard are looking for is, uh, I don't know what, are all their guard obligations going to be uh, other than maybe going off for a certain number of weeks each year. Do they, are the, do they all fit into um, off time outside of a normal work week so they can have a, a full-time job and be a drilling member? Yes, sir. That, that's how we're built. Um, I, I, the, the pitch used to be one week in a month, two weeks a year. Um, given the operational tempo and some of the unpredictability and some of the events that we've seen, um, we do ask folks to come on occasion uh, on, on a set of orders. COVID is an example of that. Uh, they have the expertise either medical providers or medical administration, logisticians to support food distribution. We ask those folks to come on orders uh, and they're able to help us out for the duration of those orders. We ask them to do that in conjunction with 
their employers, certainly with the support of their families. Um, and then, um, and for students, you know, obviously that's, that's a risk for them. We don't want them to miss school. Uh, in most instances, if it's a normal training year, for instance, you're going to get a training schedule a year out. So you'll know when your drill dates are. You're going to know when your annual training is. And you're certainly going to have about a year lead time if there's a significant collective training event at the Joint Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk or if you've got, um, you know, an exercise for the, for the 150th fighter wing. There'll be plenty of lead time for you uh, to allow for planning for, for all the parties engaged in it. Okay. Great. Um, and so the, the, I think, did you say Think Vermont? Was that the name of the, the program you're proposing? Uh, yes, sir. It's actually, the, there, uh, there's already a, a website uh, with uh, Link Vermont. We're working with Elaine. Uh, I don't remember her last name off the top of my head, with Department of Labor. So she's been oh, kind sure. of working in the background um, and probably with Agency of Digital Services to revise that website. Um, and there'll be uh, links on there to focus it on veterans and bringing those prior service folks and retirees to Vermont, um, marketing Vermont. So we've got a draft of, of the uh, the website. It's not live yet, the, revi the revised website. Uh, so we're in the process of reviewing that. Um, we anticipate having that launched in about a month. I'll confirm that with Dustin. Uh, but that should be a, a pretty significant event. Um, I don't know to what degree we've we've engaged in this level of marketing Vermont before. Uh, again, there's a lot of things that go on in the background that are certainly transparent to me. I just know there's more that we can do uh, to make this a, a destination for folks. Um, my linkage obviously is for folks either retiring or coming off active duty. Um, either they retire here and work here or they come here, join the guard and, and, and find employment in Vermont. Okay. So it sounds like from our side, um, helping make the career opportunities related to the work we're talking about um, more visible so that you can also then share them with others is helpful. Yes, sir. And I think it's going to be building the website and, and the content is, is only limited by what we give them. Um, I, I will defer to them to come up with the format. We'll certainly take a look at it and, and, and put it out there as a pilot. And it's, to me, it's not a one and done. Um, but again, I think as we continue to revise it, we'll have an opportunity to gauge, you know, measures of effectiveness and measures of performance. Um, we can certainly track how many folks are viewing it, how many folks are clicking through. And in the end, how many folks are actually, you know, sending resumes if we get to that point and, and actually taking overt action and considering Vermont um, as a destination. Okay, great. So, um that when you were mentioning Think Vermont, so I was thinking of at first that you were talking about something entirely new, but this is adding to the current initiative. I think this website might be a couple of years old now, two or three years old, uh, part of marketing Vermont more broadly uh, as part of uh, like the state has an effort to pay people to relocate here, um, which brings me to a next question. Are there um, tools that you've seen other units use that turns that uh, state into a particularly desirable state to re right, retire into or join the garden um, from your perspective? Uh, yes, sir, there are. Uh, and this is something else that I've, uh, I've really focused on is, is kind of, and I've talked with the National Guard Bureau about it. I've got the chief of National Guard Bureau coming up here on Friday. So I'll have an office call with him. Um, but there are a number of best practices out there. I use homebaseiowa.gov um, as an example. That was a go-by for me. Um, it seemed brilliant in its simplicity. Uh, but as an example, I spoke with the um, General Landis yesterday. He's the 1st Army uh, Division East Commander. Um, he works for uh, Northern Command, um, which obviously is a homeland defense primarily, but that's that's North America. Um and I, I talked specifically about recruiting and he had some great ideas on how we leverage social media. And again, it's, it's a function of networking um, and, and it becomes exponential if we do it right. So he's going to give me some, uh, some thoughts. I will use the public affairs office. And I think all of this is nested um, to, to bring folks here to Vermont. And again, coming back to the intent here is getting folks into the trades where we need them. Um, when these folks come off active duty, I, why are we focusing 
only on Vermont. I think we need to focus nationwide. Um, there's just a lot of best practices out there. I, I think kind of coalescing them and putting them in the same place is going to be beneficial for us. Um, again, great product to sell. We just need to do a better job of selling it. Sure. Um, well, and it seems as though, <laughs> I don't really know. My sense is that virtual marketing, as in the website can be accessed from anywhere, um, it's a pretty economical way of reaching a much larger audience, right? Yes, sir. And, and there's other mechanisms that we have. Um, so we can, we can use, um, we can use those reserve component career counselors um, and, and the recruiters and the air guard, they're called in service recruiters. Their job is to put people in the guard and the reserve. Um, there's no limit to what we can share with them. Um, and if, if, job availability, job opportunities is part of that conversation. That becomes part of the marketing effort, whether it's virtual, whether it's posters, whether it's, you know, trifolds, there's, there's just so many things that I don't think we're doing. Certainly I can tell you we're not doing it as a guard, not effectively, uh, not to the degree we can. Okay. And that's it. Well, so, Mr. Yeah. Greg, go ahead, sir. Um, I, I'm just wondering if, yeah, I was gonna say, do you have anything else you'd like to be sharing? Uh, interrupted with questions a few times so I don't want to knock you off uh, knock you off your presentation and so I, I think if, if you look at, at a, a, as a military <laughs> retiree destination state I think we're number 49 in the nation we've got to fix that um, based on what statistic picture, uh, I'll have to dig that out uh, depends on which publication you go to and I don't know what their metrics are I know that we're not where we need to be um, you could look at probably Forbes, any number of the business magazines. Uh, are they looking at taxation? Are they looking at cost of living, job availability? You can, you can adjust the variables, certainly, Senator. I just know we can do better than we're doing. So um, do we have a PX in Vermont? We had a very small one, um, a non-appropriated funds activity. And then uh, big picture, they closed it. It was uh, not cost effective to maintain it here didn't have enough throughput uh, of, of uh, customers to maintain it. So the answer, we do not have one. Is it correct that the, uh, co the, the correlation between um, that where veterans locate is most closely tied to whether or not there is a PX available? Uh, PX and commissary privileges and access to medical facilities is certainly a consideration. Uh, I think we can offset that. Uh, by, by certainly better representing what we have here in Vermont. Uh, our quality of life is unparalleled as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I, when we're talking about attracting veterans to Vermont, I would hope we would start with the publications and the criteria that are most correlated to actually attracting, but that's not the subject that we have at hand. So I will, um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Well, so uh, General, you know, uh, to follow up on Senator McDonald's uh, question, I I know that sort of in general publications, like you were referring to Forbes, right? And um, so we've I've actually, as along with Senator McDonald, as a member of finance, we hear about Vermont's tax policy uh, on a regular basis. I don't. Has anyone? done a military specific study, you know, like looking, basically, I guess it would be something like polling uh, retirees or um, folks coming out of active duty service who are looking maybe to continue in a guard, what factors they use when they make, what when they go through their decision-making, you know, like to what degree is it the wages uh, of that unit or the presence or absence of a PX commissary good health care facilities in the region uh, and anything else, you know, it'd be good for us to know. We only hear about the one piece that we are one of the few jurisdictions that uh, tax uh, military pensions. And so we know that's a bone of contention, but we don't know how that compares to all the other factors that influence their decision-making on where to settle or resettle. And that would be helpful. Obviously, it's a bigger conversation. Um, 
but that that could be helpful to everyone, not just in this weatherization conversation, but also as we have those discussions in the uh, uh, ongoing in finance. Yes, sir. And there, there's a number of considerations. I can do some research uh, with Mr. Gregg um, and get that back to you. Um, one thing I know is, is certainly important is, is especially for younger families is child care. Availability of child care. It's great that they can come here and work, but um, what do they do with their kids? Yep. So a lot of, a lot of things to consider. Absolutely. Sure. Yes, okay. um, yeah. And uh, so I'm just thinking, getting a little off track, but this is a, this comes up in multiple ways in terms of getting people in the workforce or allowing them to stay there is uh, knowing their kids have good care when they're at work. Um, do uh, bases in Vermont offer on base child care? Any of the military facilities, or is that st strictly that's something you take care of sort of on your private life side? Yeah, we offer nothing right now, sir. Um, I've worked, um, Senator Hardy put me in touch with Allie Richards from Let's Grow Kids. Uh, so we're partnered with them. I know she has um, a strategic approach. To, to kind of helping resolve the child care issues in Vermont. Um, we do have some niche requirements that for years, as long as I've been in this organization, we simply haven't fixed yet uh, for drilling members. You, you try to alleviate the pressure where you can with flexible drill schedules, and sometimes it's simply not possible. Um, so yeah. it, it makes it a challenge. Um, and in some instances can be a deterrent um, to service in the guard. Okay, all right, great. Um, Anything else you'd like to make us aware of this morning? Um, uh, well, Senator, I do appreciate the opportunity. Um, the other thing, um, what was the timeline, Ken? How many years of retirees have stayed static versus the number? Four at this point, almost five. So we did a little research uh, on the number of military retirees in Vermont. How many of those? 3,900? There's currently 3,900 touring pay in Vermont. Yep. There's, there's about, and I can certainly send you the, the, the VA worksheet that shows the, uh, the contribution um, of veterans, uh, retired pay and benefits into Vermont. Um, but the number of retirees has remained static for the past four years at 3,900. Um, we've had hundreds of members retire from the Guard, um, and it, it indicates to me that they're not staying here. So we haven't figured out why that is yet other than anecdotally. Um, and again, that's, that's going to take some work to figure that out. Uh, probably doing exit interviews uh, and actually capturing that data uh, as soldiers and airmen retire from the guard. And then only then I think we truly have some empirical data to say, here, here's, here's what we need to fix. Uh, that'll take us a little while to get that done, but yep. we'll continue working okay. on it. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm looking to see if there are any other uh, comments, questions from the committee for General May. All right. Well, thank you very much for um, contributing to this morning's conversation. Seems like there's yet another opportunity here. And um, the question is, you know, how do we figure out how to uh, engage the population and uh, draw some more people into a, a career path that includes um, well, if I were to try to call it and name it in an exciting way, it's, it's a once in a century transformation of an economy that's relied almost heavily, uh, most heavily on fossil fuels to going to cleaner fuels. So it's a huge transformation, which means there's going to be a lot of opportunity for people to do good work in the field. Um, the back of the math, and yeah, right. And we do look forward to, to, to working with, with the legislature on any way we can to, again, bring that talent here. Um, and I, okay. I'll, send, again, I'll send that document to you uh, for retirees. Um, and anything else you're interested in, I can talk specifically about what I understand for Fort Drum as a small vignette of the nationwide potential of bringing people to Vermont. Okay. So thank you again. It's good to see you. Uh, thanks for making time to visit with us this morning. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, committee. Appreciate right. the opportunity. Okay. So, committee, that's going to wrap up our um, visits with folks this morning from just double checking the list, make sure we haven't left anyone in a 
a waiting room. No, we have not. Um, and um, so I wanted to pause and before we uh, wrap up for the morning and just say, um, Ellen has drafted a bill. I had some preliminary edits for her. And <laughs> one of the challenges is I can't walk up to her office at the end of the day anymore and sit down and just walk through those things. So the, uh, the virtual world is, is a little challenging when it comes to bills and bill editing. Um, so uh, I'm gonna have an appointment with her later today. I'm hoping that we have a, a well, subject to your availability. <laughs> this is part of what I have to follow up when we finish committee. Um, to uh, have a bill to walk through and um, continue to take testimony. We have uh, a week when we get back and uh, at chairs yesterday, I said, yes, we would have the bill out by the 12th, the Friday of the, the week we're back. Um, what I'd like to do is have a, a bill for all of us to see and just at least formally, you know, put into the hopper and have it introduced and on our wall before we leave for town meeting break. Um, so we'll have, we'll have that piece moving along. Um, I don't know if anyone based on this morning's testimony has any impressions or we didn't get to hear from agency of education that was just availability. And again, from three other sets of witnesses, um, that was uh, folks from coming from the BIPOC community, folks who can talk to us about opportunities for new Americans coming into the system and um, fuel dealers who already have a lot of experience with training and education and delivering different services to um, people who wanna stay warm. So uh, those are all still coming uh, and couldn't be part of this morning's agenda. So let me pause and say any thoughts, conclusions, questions, you know, based on what we did this morning, someone you want to hear from and I, Senator Campion. Yeah. So I think just, can you frame for us what you would like, and this would be helpful for me as well, since uh, we may end up getting this bill in education and our week after crossover is or a town meeting week is filling up quickly. And maybe we can take this offline, but what exactly do you intend to put in here around the educational component? What do you expect us to be looking at? We just heard um, from good. a day of witnesses related to right. what's happening out there. And uh, so tell me what that was for. What do you expect to see? Um, my sense is that we have some money now. So if what I'm hoping we will end up doing is appropriating money out of the current one-time funds, they could be expended over two years. They don't, it doesn't all have to happen in the next year, but that we would appropriate money that would help uh, the address workforce development and education. So Pacific. we already have existing programs. So you right. do an appropriation. Also, there's the pro bill proposes to have a working group uh, with members of different committees. So we break the silo problem down. And one of the ongoing pieces in there would be workforce development. So when you say workforce developments, we just have a few minutes to think this through and have a conversation. What in your mind is is missing? What is it that you would say we need to be working toward? Um, well, I have an answer. Uh, Senator McDonald uh, has that, an answer. That specific, that kind of thing. I, I workforce development. Is I would say, I would say a coordinated system of de development, um, a way of certifying people. Yeah. Um, and a way of delivering uh, credentials beyond just certification, like the apprenticeship programs do. And so I think that all fits into building a career pathway, not just that you went and got a job weatherizing. 
so that we can fill the pipeline so we have people to do this work. Yes. That's, right. that's yeah. really helpful. So what we're saying right now, if people said, what did you guys do today? I would say, listen, we are concerned there might not be a pipeline of individuals to do the work that we are about to push out. And we are trying to uh, make certain that people have the certification programs, the credentialing and all that kind of thing so that this money can go out and people can act on it. Would that be accurate? Yes. Perfect. And the credentialing too, as the other part we heard and Senator McDonald brought it up, um, we don't want to be weatherizing poorly, right? We don't want to create homes right. that become problem homes. Right. So for an assurance from the customer side and the long-term success of the program, we that's another reason to have people actually trained. That's a marketing program. You 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 hurt your marketing if you don't if you do bad work. That's not a right. That's a separate issue. I would say the biggest problem is um, in, in the absence of long-term funding that is in the pipeline and ready to go, who the hell would um, sign up to go to college for, for a program that is promised to be in the future, but isn't funded? How many people are you gonna get to sign up to fly, train how to fly you know, pilot airplanes if you haven't got the airplanes? Um, so in this case, like Trump University, you know, they get people to sign up for stuff. And, and, you know. Right. So I think, out. yeah. So from the people who implement the work, that the most important thing they've said is you need, and the PUC put this in their report, right? Robust, sustainable, long-term funding uh, at a higher level. So. I'm uh, hopeful that that's actually what we are going to establish. Um, again, we have one-time money. It's a bridge. But meanwhile, we're changing the, the proposal to change the tax structure and create a thermal energy efficiency charge, which has been the, the little engine that could that's driven 20 plus years of energy efficiency work to the clear benefit of the state of Vermont. So we're standing up the one piece of the money puzzle. Then we've talked about bonds as a way to also accelerate the amount of money available. Uh, and then we took some testimony on to the meter billing that meant you had more money available and it didn't require people to be out there taking loans. So my, and we've taken a little testimony on the the public health benefits. Um, so there are states already using CMS, uh, Medicaid dollars to do some of this work. My sense is we are gonna try to, we will assemble a bigger stream of money. And that goes to Senator McDonald's thing of getting, getting the customers. You don't have the little engine that could leave in the station. You can't hook any cars to it. Well, okay, so the, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how much I want to stick with this metaphor because now the, the uh, we're it's, talking about creating it in a revenue neutral way for the coming year because we're receiving money. After that, I think it will be the basis for raising more money. You, yeah. I, Mr. Chair, um, yeah. I, was, I, I texted someone today about the book, The Conquest of Everest, and it's the 16th chapter of The Conquest of Everest, where they discuss the last two days where they climbed to the top of the mountain. The Conquest of F Everest was establishing the program and funding it, and that took place in the first 15 chapters of the book over you know, four or five or six years. And we're spending our time on 
what are we going to do on the 48 hours before we make the dash to the top of the mountain? Um, we are assuming a lot of things are going to happen without us planning them out and lead and providing a roadmap. And if we don't do that, who will? Okay, so good. So here's, here's, let me propose this version of an answer that we, we do this tax restructuring and the working group continues to work on figuring out how to raise more money in the years to come. And the governor bought us time to do that, to take that on. So that to me feels like, you know, I don't know, in your story, chapters one through 15, um, there's a chance to also take money that we have received and apply it to workforce development based on the people who are currently there to help um, do more of the things we heard about this morning. And, um, and so, you know, I, I guess, I don't know where to put us in the, um, I don't think we're getting to the final chapters till, till we pass a bill next year, like to really see how much long-term money and how many more people are gonna to get to work in the field. What we have now is we're trying to leverage a moment in time where we can establish a way of doing it and the money to help us make a start. Well, it's, a, it's gotta be a package deal. And, and um, I guess we'll all have different opinions on what is a satisfactory package. So. Okay. Well, I, I'm, Great, agreed. I mean, I, you know, we'll uh, walk through the details, and um, so I'll I'll work with Ellen to see about having the quote unquote the package, our first package to walk through AS, ASAP, and then we can edit that thing and increase our level of confidence all the way around. I hope that what we have will work. Um, Senator McCormick. <laughs> you're up, uh, you're off one, you're. Sorry, uh, uh, I wanted to show a little support for Senator McDonald's critique. Uh, Cindy and I got Chinese takeout last night. And my fortune cookie said, good fortune is a matter of preparation. But having said that, I would also say that preparation can include envisioning the end. All the preparation, you got to keep in mind what your preparations are aimed at. So maybe that's some common ground between the chair and Senator McDonald. My two cents worth. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Westman, I see the wheels turning. No, wait, um, so when will you have a draft to us? Uh, I, can, uh, I can share the draft I have currently that mine is quite marked up. So I was trying to get one more round of markup done before we had it in committee. That was my goal. So we would have it tomorrow. That's um, if I, I, I was just looking to because you talked about a draft and I hadn't I didn't see one. So I was um, uh, I, tomorrow's fine, but um, I'm looking for a draft. Right. Absolutely. OK. Um, it's hard to react right. when you don't have one. I agree. So. Um, that top of list for me is to uh, get back to council who's been ready, willing and able and complete that. And then we'll have something to look at in committee. Um, so with that, I, I think that's probably our most useful next step is to walk through and then we can sort out to what degree 
things seem clear and we have a useful pathway to getting there versus we haven't addressed something important. Um, okay. Anything else? All right, I know what I'll be doing the next <laughs> number of hours. Um, so with that, I think, you know, I don't have anything, we don't have any more uh, work scheduled for this morning. So um, 